Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to call the Planning Commission meeting for, for uh, Wednesday, May 17th, 2023, regular meeting in City Hall at 6 p.m. And before we do any other business, we need to approve the amended agenda. So I'll take a motion to amend. I'll make a motion to approve the amended agenda. Second. Okay. Brittany makes the motion. Ted makes the um, second. All in favor. Don't we need roll call? Did we do? Well, shouldn't we do the amended first? Do we need to do roll call first? We got to be here first. Okay. Roll call. Thank you. <laughs> Radock here. Buck here. 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 Okay, now we go to the amended. So we can we go ahead and stick with that motion? Okay, and Ted made the second. And is there any discussion? All in favor of approval? Aye. Let the record show is, is approved. All right, now we go on to approval of minutes. Any corrections, changes? Take a motion to approve. I move approval of uh, last month's minutes, April 19th. Second. Okay. Rick makes the motion. Matthew makes the second. All in favor or any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 That is approved. All right. Welcome to the public. We have a number of things on our agenda, and when it's something of interest for you each time, I will allow public comment. Um, so our new business is agenda item 3A, uh, the 2023 and 2024 Planning Commission Work Program. Um, so John, you wanna introduce it? Yes, I can, Madam Chairman. Um, at the last meeting, I had informed the planning commission that I would take a look at the city's master plan in terms of the implementation strategies that were outlined in chapter six and put together what I thought would be some priority action items that the planning commission could start working on as part of your uh, annual uh, work program. Uh, the three that I selected, you have 12 themes in the implementation chapter and 163 actionable items. So a lot of those I selected three. The first one was basically the action item in your plan was to continue to utilize the International Property Maintenance Code to improve, improve properties and eliminate blight. And I am recommending that the Planning Commission in, uh, in assistance with the consultant and the city staff prepare a housing quality assessment uh, to determine what areas in the city may need assistance. Uh, I believe this would help position the city in the future to use certain housing related programs, such as the neighborhood enterprise zone in the housing rehabilitation districts that were just approved in uh, January of this year, uh, primarily because Petoskey is one of 100 core communities identified by the Michigan Economic Development Corporation for certain qualified programs. Uh, without doing a housing quality assessment, it's awful. It's difficult to target areas where you would want selective code enforcement and areas that you would wanna use certain tax incentives or abatement programs in order to assist and encourage property owners to rehabilitate their homes. The second action item is that I'm recommending that we uh, create a committee of the Planning Commission, much like what we did for the uh, short-term rental ordinance. And that committee would take a look at the potential to uh, enact or recommend the inaction or the action to the city council to create a formal rental inspection program. This would be done once we complete the housing quality assessment to determine the extent of rental properties in the city and the rental inspection program would be used to make sure that the properties are improved and that they're maintained uh, by those that rent the properties to residents in the community. 
The third action item is also housing related to some degree and it involves the zoning ordinance. The city is going to apply in October at the beginning of the state fiscal cycle uh, to MEDC for money under the RRC, the Redevelopment Ready Program, to uh, amend and revise the city zoning ordinance. Uh, to get ready for that, I'm recommending that we have a steering committee that starts taking a look at uh, district consolidation, minimum lot sizes, lot coverage, building heights and housing typologies by district. Uh, the reason why I uh, recommend uh, steering committee or uh, subcommittees of the planning commission is that we're able to meet more often. And those folks that are on the committees with me, we can gain greater insight into the topics so we can bring back formal recommendations to the committee as a whole. Uh, so the planning commission can have a more comprehensive review of the topic. So that's the action program that I've suggested to the planning commission for 23-24 uh, as part of the implementation of the community master plan. Okay, thank you. I bring it back to the commission for discussion. Rick? Question for John, does that uh, first action item require or, or would that involve hiring a consultant to do that kind of, a, of an assessment or is that staff done? The combination of myself working with staff. Oh, okay. Yeah. Putting the methodology together that we can do the uh, the assessment. This is not going to be a property by property. Oh, right. It'll be based on information that the city has along with a windshield survey I see. and looking at census data. Okay. Thanks. Ted? Yeah, another question on action item one that Commissioner Newen was talking about. Um, so, uh, the consultant in the city would be trying to determine areas that are blank or need assistance. I mean, these, these are not necessarily exactly always the same thing. I mean, an area can be blighted and may or may not have someone who has the ability to fix that. So I, I'm, I'm a little unclear. Well, uh, Commissioner, it's it's a kind of a combination of both. It's one taking a look at housing quality in terms of area, trying to isolate by neighborhood areas that have that we would we would identify as stable, and then we I try to identify neighborhoods that need assistance in terms of uh, rehabilitation. There can be blighted properties in in stable neighborhoods as well as in neighborhoods that need assistance. But as we go through the process, we can identify both. So and 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 build and start building a record of that. That's why uh, this is usually. A, the housing quality assessment at the neighborhood level is a combination of consultant and, and staff bringing together both of their areas of expertise to identify both housing quality concerns and areas that may, may see a certain degree and number of blighted properties. So, so I get that part where you would assess in, in, in some way determine which properties were deemed as in need of uh, repair or blighted um needing assistance is a different issue you have to have more information yeah, yes but what happens is when you do the housing quality assessment let's say we localize eight or ten blocks within the city that have a high degree of need for improvements then we can discuss with the city council if they want to utilize several different programs available by the state at the neighborhood level which encourage people to renovate their properties. And in doing so, they would be able to uh, receive an abatement on the level of improvements that they make to the property. So we isolate the neighborhoods, we determine what the degree of problem is, and then we come back to the planning commission and the city council with what tools are available at the state that we can use in those neighborhoods to encourage property owners to make the rehabilitations, to try to make them as uh, reasonable as possible. Uh, in addition, because of the income, uh, uh, median income of the city, the city could possibly also qualify for community development block grants and actually have a housing rehabilitation program that provides financial assistance to people to renovate their properties. But we won't know that until we do the assessment. How does that then play into a property that's um, single family 
home ownership versus a rental property. Is there a difference or not? Uh, in, not in terms of the abatements, no. Uh, in terms of rental property, if the, and I don't want to get too far ahead of the commission, but much of the properties in the city were built uh, prior to 1940. And a significant amount of them, I know that you, we already have the Mitchell Street, uh, Lake Street Historic District, but areas on the south side of the city, over on Jackson, Madison, and those streets would also qualify for national register status. Now, income property owners that have that are located in a national register district have access to the IRS historic income tax tax credit, which is 20%. And then the state provides an additional five, but that's on income property only. But that's that's a great incentive for a rental property owner to rehabilitate their properties according to the historic guidelines to get a 25% return dollar for dollar back from the federal government. Charlie? Yeah, uh, when you were describing action item number two, you you were referring to the rental programs. Would this assessment also be determining which were owned properties and which were rental properties versus the licensed short-term rental property? Correct. We would try to make that determination at that at that level. And the tools that you use to do that? A variety of tools. That's where we work with the city. I mean, their information on code enforcement issues of the past, building, you know, uh, permits that have been issued by the county if they've been issued to this property owner or a property owner that's running the property. So it's just a little bit of paperwork and investigation to try to make that determination. The, the more uh, qualitative and the more granular we get on the data, the, the better the strategy is relative to uh, going after the appropriate funding and tax abatement programs. So if I understood your recommendations, number one would be staff and consultancy. Number two would be under the auspices of a steering committee. Correct. And number three would be under the auspices of a steering committee. That's correct. Both steering committees would be from the planning commission. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. On action item number three, <clears throat> we, we've spent some time already talking about district consolidation. How does this relate to? Um, the time that we've already spent in, in terms of it, it would be a continuation of that conversation. And the work that we've done is that on hold and with, you know, as you know, obviously from your perspective, from your input, the work that we've done is that on hold until we, until the steering group was, was put together. Yeah, I think once the steering committee was put together, then we bring, you bring forth the information that the planning commission's already talked about within the steering committee, and then we go from there. We use that as the springboard to continue that conversation. When I hear number three, um, it seems like this is really the one of the fundamental responsibilities of the commission. Yes. And one of, I guess, my initial response is a little concerned that it's in a smaller group versus the whole group. Could you just kind of speak to your opinions on the value of having it in a steering committee versus out here and having um, a, a, you know, a broader input from the very initial stages? Well, typically when you do the uh, zoning code, uh, you, we would have a kickoff meeting at the planning commission level to identify, or the planning commission to, to identify areas of concern that they have with the current code. Okay, we start with that. Then we move it into the steering committee and the committee can meet like on every other week basis versus once a month, like the planning commission does. It's just a way of going through the document quicker and bringing back full drafts that have been reviewed and picked apart by the steering committee uh, to the PC. It's just like the process that we used on the uh, short-term rental ordinance. I, I would estimate that based on the amount of time that was spent by the subcommittee, and then we had kind of two iterations digitally on email, we probably were able to compress the review time on the short-term rental probably by three to four months just by doing that process. And that's kind of how, it, you know, we when I typically work out with the community on a zoning code, it's usually at the committee level 
And periodically, uh, we keep the committee at four planning commission members, uh, but sometimes the, one of the four at any time can rotate out. So if, an area, if a planning commissioner has a personal uh, area of interest in the zoning code, when we get to that, then they would come in and, and sit down as part of the subcommittee and one person would, you know, be you know, it would, like a revolving door. There's some people on planning commissions that are very detailed oriented uh, that want to get into like the dimensional requirements, the bulk requirements. There are other planning commissioners that want to talk broader scale in terms of like district consolidation and maybe new zoning districts. And when we get into those topics, then it, it, based on people's area of interest, they, they get into the committee. But I find that the committee can accelerate a zoning rewrite by months, if not maybe by a year, because it is a it's a very it's a very lengthy document to go through. Bethany, um, is your recommendation that we work on multiple action items at once, or are we choosing the highest priority right now? No, we work on them all together. Okay. So we, I'm asking for two subcommittees. I would imagine it would pretty much be. Four people on one committee, yeah. four people on another. So almost all the planning commission, to some degree, would be involved in various actionable items. Your master plan content, it was extremely well done by the planning commission and by Amy. Uh, my concern about it is not the twelve themes, but it's the hundred and sixty-three action items. <laughs> yeah. You don't, you do not have the capacity to do one hundred and sixty-three action yeah. items. So I went through and tried to really prioritize the ones that would have the most meaningful, immediate impact for the community. And those all focus around one zoning and two of them focus around housing. Any other discussion? Do we, do we need to make a motion to accept this? Well, that's what I... Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll make the motion to accept the proposed 2023 2024 planning commission work program as outlined by Jim. Second. Oh, okay, so Rick makes the motion. Charlie seconds. Um, any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Okay, and opposed? Okay. And Chair, I suggest? Yes. Can we, while we're on this subject, and we decide who's going to be on the committees. All right. Are people ready to yeah. volunteer? So the first item is the, um, well, you don't want, just for number two and three are where we're looking for student committee members. All right. So the rental inspection program. I'd be happy to. Okay. Bethany, Matthew. We're looking for four members. Rick? I'd prefer to be on the third or the second. You mean Rich? Committee, I would say. Right. Who's, who's, on, the, who's on the committee? Rich. Bethany, Matthew, and Rich. Um, so let's move on to the zoning ordinance requirements. Rick? Charlie? Ted and Carolyn. Um, all right. I also would like to be a part of that. We only have four. Okay. And also we have to do, we, we can do five if you want to do open meeting oh. sake, but um, so we can do okay. a to rotate out. Seriously, will you go to the rental inspection I'll, program? I'll rotate in to either committee as, as may be appropriate. Can I put you down for the, the, for the initial steering committee for the rental inspection? And not at this time. Okay. Thank you, Charlie. All right. Well, we have three for the rental inspection program, and then Rick, Ted, Carolyn, and Cynthia for the I mean, zoning ordinance. When's a preferable time? Everybody like everybody like to meet in the evening or the afternoon? I don't know what you're scared. Well, first off, is everybody available in the afternoon? To raise your hand if you're not. Depends on the why day. Take, why take one committee at a time? All right. 
So for the rental inspection program, I just have to find a sitter if okay if it's during the day. You need to be evening. Yeah, it just I've got sports going on. Oh, that's there, right. So that's right. It just depends on. Rich, do you have any? I'm relatively flexible afternoons or evenings. Okay. <clears throat> what? What? Um, uh, uh, let me go ahead. Let me make a suggestion. What I'll do is I've got the names on the committee. I will send a, a doodle poll out to the committee members, and then you guys can pick day and you can pick times, and then we can we can start from there with uh, putting a calendar together. Okay. Okay. All right. Cool. Okay. And then for the zoning, that's Rick, Ted, Carolyn, and Cynthia. So, can you meet during the day, or Ted? Can you meet during the day? Most days, there okay. Will be some conflicts. And how about you? Right? I have three points. Okay, and I can meet during the day. So, moving on. Moving on to old business. We have 4A in old business, public hearing on case number 2-23, rezoning request for parcel C uh, from R2 single family district to I1 light industrial district to match the zoning of parent parcel C which is adjacent to 1624 Clare, Clarion Avenue. John? Yes, Madam Chair, there's a staff memo. It's in your packet regarding the project. Uh, the gentleman, Brian Hall, is the applicant. Uh, he owns a parcel of property on Clarion. Actually, it's a, it's a public road unnamed off of Clarion. Um, you can see it on the map. Uh, in, on page two of the staff memo, you can see the parcel uh, in a little bit more detail. It's a very small piece compared to his other property, which is uh, zoned I-1, which is parcel 201-058. He would like to rezone parcel 201-059 to I-1, so both of his properties are under the same zoning designation. Uh, the properties adjacent to him are uh, all zoned light industrial. Uh, the property that's above the ridge line that Orange dash line is the approximate ridge line, which is probably has a 50 foot elevation between the properties that face Clarion and the properties above it. Uh, and it is not in conflict with the master plan and the properties in that area, the majority of them along this side of this area of Clarion are all, all zoned light industrial and our, our recommendation uh, is that uh, from our perspective, it doesn't conflict with the master plan. It's consistent with zoning in the area. Uh, and, you know, that's my uh, uh, my read on the application. Okay. With Brian Hall, is he here? Okay. If you would like to speak, you're welcome to. Is he on the Zoom? Okay. All right. So I bring it to the commission. Any questions, discussion? Rich? Yeah, I, I was just curious uh, why that section wasn't zoned late industrial to begin with. Why is it residential? I, I have. I don't know. Okay. Just wonder if there was a reason for that. Charlie? Just for clarity on the uh, Emmett County equalization view, uh, the it looks like L-shaped, but that's the road. The long, narrow part is the road, right? The, it, in other words, uh, 201059 
it, it's just not finished off as a perfect rectangle there. It's, it's you see what I'm saying? It, yeah. it, that, it, that's the pub, that's a public right. So that's the public easement. Yes. It, okay. There's no name to it, but that's public. Okay. That long linear strip that connects in with Clarion Avenue. Okay. It's like a so, driveway. So the, the rectangle was just simply not finished on, on that drawing. Got it. Thank you. It actually is, but it's hard to see because yeah, they it's it's, 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 it's a gray line, line, but the gray line is there. Yeah, yes. yeah it's hard Here. to see. Any other discussion? Are we ready to make a motion? Oh, that's right. I am sorry, public. <laughs> All right. I open the uh, public hearing. Is there anyone who wishes to comment? Anyone online? So no comment. <clears throat> okay, I close the public hearing. What did somebody say? Albert Moss, are you here? Oh, okay. I wanted to comment on the last. Doesn't matter. His comment was on the previous discussion. Apparently. Oh, I, I guess I'll wait. To, I'll, I'll wait till discussions at the end. Okay. So no comments for the public hearing. So I close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission. I'll make a motion to uh, recommend to city council that uh, parcel 521907 uh, be rezoned from light industrial R1 to R2 single family uh, to match the parent parcel. Excuse, I hate to interrupt, but did you mean to change? You said from L1 to R2. It's the opposite. This this is a the suggested motion if we're approving. Do you want to read that? Uh, oh, I I okay. Sorry, I reversed it. My apology. Yeah, in case number two dash twenty three, I make a motion so that the request to rezone parcel fifty two nineteen oh seven two oh one zero fifty nine from R two single family to L1 light industrial be recommended to city council for approval based on the facts presented and the finding that the request is consistent with the city master plan, the future land use map and zoning plan, and that the rezoning will not adversely affect surrounding properties. Thank you. I'll second. Okay, Rick makes the motion, Ted seconds. Uh, roll call. Robson? Yes. Wilma? Yes. Braddock? Yes. Buck? Yes. Jetmer? Yes. McSweeney? Yes. Meridian? Yes. Newman? Yes. Paul? Yes. All right. Moving on to old business uh, number 4B, site plan amendment for loss at Lumber Square, 900 Emmett. Before um, the zoning administrator has what do I do something? No, I just need to. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, I have a conflict of interest as we own a business within 300 feet, so I need to recuse myself. Okay. And is there anyone else with a conflict of interest? I have to recuse myself at this point. Okay. Madam Chairman, I don't, I, uh, I don't believe it's a conflict of interest, but I would like to disclose okay. uh, uh, a connection. Uh, the developer, the Hoffs Han development, uh, in its normal course of business interacts with banks and seeks financing. I am, a, I am an employee of a bank and Han development is a customer of the bank that I work at. Our bank has provided finance financing to an affiliated company of Han development. Uh, the loan was unrelated to the Lofts at Lumber Square and, uh, and, uh, and the uh, the outcome of the loss at Lumber Square was not a factor in us uh, doing our other loan with Han Developments, and that I received and will receive no financial gain 
or uh, loss as a result of the success or failure of the law of the loss project. Okay. Uh, so how does the commission see this? Do, does anyone believe there's a conflict of interest? No. No. Do we need to vote on whether it's a conflict of interest? We can. All right. Um, so all in favor of having him stay on and, and um, agreeing that it's not a conflict right. of interest? All right. All right. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for disclosing. All right. Uh, so Lisa, do you want to do an overview? So um, as you'll recall, on April 5th, the um, applicant came before the Planning Commission um, at a special meeting and was given approval for a site plan amendment um, with conditions. Those list, uh, conditions are listed in the agenda memo. Um, staff did note changes that were identified on the current drawings compared to those that were um, approved with conditions at that April 5th meeting. Those changes include um, shortening the divider wall at the southeast end of the building and to avoid any conflict with the encroaching on the sidewalk. The divider wall at the southwest end of the building has been removed. One parking space has been reduced, or it has been reduced by one parking space um, to 62 spaces, but there are six on street spaces approved. So they still meet their 68 parking spaces that are required. 28 bike parking spaces are indicated on the new drawings. Um, access to the Greenway corridor has been removed. Um, trees have been added along the southwest side of the parking area, as well as um, Fulton Street. The ones that had been removed have been replaced. Dwarf arborvitae have been added to either side of the Emmett Street parking lot entrance, and significant landscaping has been added around the exterior of the building and around the courtyard. Um, facade changes include addition of window overhangs, stone sills, and stone headers on, along Emmett and Fulton Streets, and door overhangs have been added along the entrances of the courtyard. The parapet height has been increased two feet on the bump out portions of the building, increasing the overall height to 35 feet. The standard allows for a maximum height of 37 feet. So it is within the standards that has been met. And then exterior um, materials have been updated with vinyl and aluminum siding, stone panel system, veneer brick, vinyl windows, and composite trim and fascia. Okay. I bring it back to the commission. Um, tonight, we're just approving, we're going over and possibly approving the current design. The facade changes yeah. that you had requested. Okay. <clears throat> so she did request if we open these big things to turn off our microphone while we open them. Thank you. <laughs> Also, put on the screen. Yes. Shane, could I bother you to um, make you the presenter? Yes, please. I believe Corey has co host permissions at the moment. Um, well, she's trying to get that on the advocate, like the speak. Yeah, yeah. And can you state your name? Uh, yes. Uh, Andrew Scorfar um, with Con Development. Uh, good evening, commissioners, and uh, nice to see you again. Um, I also have a, a few folks with me, um, my colleague, Corey Monroe, uh, Jane McKenzie, Executive Director of Northern Homes uh, Community Development Corporation, uh, the eventual owner operator of the project, uh, Sarah Ford with the Petoskey Harbor Springs Area Community Foundation, um, our kind of key sponsor of the project and landowner. And then we have Eric and Brian with Hooker de Young, our architect, uh, joining us by Zoom. Um, as uh, Lisa mentioned, since the Special uh, Planning Commission on April 5th, um, really our team has, has worked to refine the exterior facade in response to the feedback that um, we received at that meeting. Um, we really feel the updates uh, this evening um, have done a good job of incorporating what we heard um, and ultimately will further ensure the project uh, fits into the fabric of the neighborhood. 
Uh, I won't go into too much detail on the updates as Lisa's done a thorough job of kind of reviewing those in her staff report. I'm also going to hit on a few quick ones just that we've incorporated that I feel like um, can, can be recapped. Um, as Lisa mentioned, we increased the height of the building. Um, that was a direct kind of conversation that we had during that meeting about providing additional screening um, to the mechanical equipment up on the roof, uh, as well as it allowed us to increase or further define um, the, the parapet design. Um, we also incorporated window awnings um, or reincorporated, as I uh, uh, should say, uh, on the ground floor uh, of the windows along Emmett and um, Fulton Streets. Uh, as we did that exercise, we also kind of re-looked re at the windows themselves. Um, so there's some, some incorporation of some larger windows, especially on the pop-outs uh, uh, on those facades. Um, we also uh, reintroduced uh, brick uh, as a material. As we did that, we were obviously conscious of introducing, um, which I think this was one of your comments, of too many materials. So there was some balance there, but we really feel like the brick uh, has done a good job and will do a good job of complementing Old Town Emmett um, Street in that corridor. Um, we spent a little time refining the trim details of the building. Uh, um, that window detail, um, I think, has been expanded, the trim around the windows, um, as well as incorporated some, some trim details on the what I'll call the, the main facade with the lap siding that we felt kind of added a little bit more texture and broke up some, some planes. Um, just in the package, we obviously included some renderings, which I hope was helpful in your review, um, and uh, further incorporated some details on our, our landscaping plan. Um, which again was was hopefully helpful. Uh, just quickly, a quick update on where we are, um, what we have been doing over the last month and a half. Um, we are or have uh, submitted our building permit application to the the county um, this week, um, and uh, we're on track still to get our final financing approvals here in the next thirty days or so, which will allow us really to progress to the closing process and um, hopefully start construction in. Uh, mid to late summer, so still on track. Um, we're here with any questions um, to answer. Thank you. Questions for Gavin? Okay. Uh, I'll open this up for what? Yeah. Uh, oh, Rich. Where, where do we? Right. So we're going to be discussing the changes and, and giving approval or not or what they're presenting tonight okay so i'll wait till the discussion okay all right i may have like public wants to weigh in this would be the time to speak up and then open up to public comment is anyone requesting on zoom for public comment no no then I will bring it back to the commission for discussion. This again, just to summarize. So my understanding is um, that the city manager, the city was made aware that there was some significant, potentially significant changes in facade and otherwise with us. So it was brought back to us. So we've kind of had this list of recommendations. Uh, the developers come back and address those. So now we would be going through this list basically and finalizing it. And then we would be done. At this point, it would be, the changes would be approved. Is that what I understand? Well, I think that um, what we're dealing with tonight and help me out, Lisa, mm -hmm. is for us to say, you've met the, the requests and we're happy with the design. I think <clears throat> everything else is still pending. You know, submit of a lighting plan, signage, right of way permits. Those conditions would stand until then. Right. And most of those were not coming to the full planning commission, were they? So, in my understanding, is we're just talking about whether this design, if we give it a go. Okay. So, does anybody have any questions, comments? Well, my comment then would be, sorry, <laughs> I think they've done a fairly nice job responding to our 
um, concerns and issues. So I was had a positive general overall impression of what they did. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to say that uh, I do agree that it's an improvement over the what was presented. Um, however, I, I'm personally I'm still not satisfied with uh, the overall look and design of the building. I just feel it doesn't fit into the neighborhood um, uh, like I expected it, and I'm looking at the the one we approved a couple of years ago, and I still find it a lot more attractive. And um, uh, maybe it's the balconies, maybe it's the larger overhangs, and even the even the window treatment uh, is at the French style glass. Um, it just has uh, just looks like it fits in the neighborhood a little bit better than than what we're presented now. Uh, another concern I had was, um, and, and it was also the, the way with the original design, uh, there doesn't seem to be any stairs access in the north side of the building. Is it only an elevator there? So on the north side of the building, yes, for that main entrance is our Austrian entrance, there's an elevator there. And then on both wings, at the right. ends of both southern wings, there is stair access. Is there a reason why there's not a stair as well? Just from design, I think considerations, we feel like that is adequate you know, circulation throughout that, that area um, with the elevator and the stairs. Obviously, with the parking lot, um, what we find, I think, especially in a three story building, um, that uh, many of the residents use the stairs. Um, and uh, that is their preference, but the connection, obviously, the elevator down to the the amenity on the ground floor is, and the pedestrian access is is sufficient. And the other question I had was, uh, uh, is there any overhead bike coverage for the where the bikes are stored, or is it uh, on the the west? Um, Yes, on the west wing, um, outside of the stairwell access, that area is, there is some covered bar bike parking there. What we do find is um, many folks obviously bring their bikes into their units. Um, that's uh, especially um, the quality of bikes that many folks do have now as well. Um, so uh, there is adequate bike parking outside, um, but again, we, we find a lot of folks will bring the bikes that they don't want to be rained on, don't want to be um, uh, messed with, are, uh, are stored inside. Okay. That, that's it for me. <clears throat> so, um, I think you've done a very nice job of absorbing the commentary that we had in the last meeting. Um, and I think that this is a, uh, a different design than the first one, but a, a different approach to the location and to the, uh, the modern aspects of the building and how it fits into the neighborhood. I had a preference for the first one too, but I understand the changes here. And I think they've done a good job of incorporating our commentary. Any other comments, Rick? Uh, yes, I'll echo Charlie's comments there in the sense that I think he did a really good job of integrating the things that we had brought up at the last meeting. I still feel that we're kind of on borderline of having almost too many different materials on the overall project, but I understand where you're coming from. And uh, while I did like the original design with the balconies, I understand how the project evolved to this point. And I don't think it's inappropriate because I think while this look, as Charlie said, is different than the previous look, to me, it, it does fit in, in that it kind of has a townhouse sort of a style as opposed to the balcony and, and apartment more look that, that the previous one did. And I think it does fit the neighborhood in that it's adjacent to the four corners area where, you know, those the four commercial buildings that are on those corners have a similar shape and proportion and facade 
look uh, as sections of this facade does. So in that sense, I think it, it is contextual and, and does work well. Um, one maybe minor criticism is just because all the parking is on the south end of the building. And I know certainly people that are headed to downtown would go in and out of the north. And, and that's a nice entrance with the, the elevator and the lobby there and all. But from the people that are parking or coming into the two south entrances, I, I think I wish that those two little entrance areas were made a little bit nicer, you know, had, had a little bit more of a sense of entry as opposed to feeling like you're just coming into the bottom of a stairwell. So I, I don't know if there's a way to address that. Again. Yes, and I, I will say maybe the uh, um, maybe we should have included a rendering of that edge, and the the elevation probably doesn't do it as well as what it should. But on um, the uh, west side of the east wing, um, uh, there there is a stairwell entrance, but there also is the office. So there will be a bit of, and there's a little bit of commercial kind of storefront at that edge um, as well, with an overhang that wraps the edge. Um, and uh, then there is actually a conference room um, that can be used by residents as well. So it'll feel there will be a very pronounced entrance from the parking lot as well. And I know from Jane's uh, perspective, uh, you know, the connection of the office to the parking lot to the um, uh, to that the main um, outdoor courtyard is pretty key in um, yeah. in the design considerations. So there will be a very kind of pronounced entrance from that side as well. Okay, good. Thank you. Other comments? Um, I agree. I think that the field is not hearing what we have to say, but it's soft, and I think it's got that slightly industrial flair, but it doesn't, it's not a shock from going from the downtown to see that. In part, it's because some of the materials are chips. So, and any more discussion? All right. Um, someone would like to make a motion? Well, I make a motion then to uh, approve the facade changes as presented tonight at the meeting. All right. Ted makes the motion. And um, should that motion be broadened to be more than just side changes? Well, I think that's all we're asked to look at because the rest of it all has to be taken. Uh, okay. You know, it has to be approved other than maybe the landscaping. Well, question. Uh, they're currently under a preliminary site review, or are they, is this the final, is this the final site review? This would be the final. The final site. Yes, they got their conditional approval in on April fifth, and then the commission asked them to come back with any facade so, changes. So that's. So does this need to be structured as a final approval motion? Um, I don't. The last approval, I believe, was a site plan approval for the amendment with conditions, not a preliminary. Right. If, and if so, I could, I, I think we've been discussing the Maple Black property, which had a preliminary site yes. approval, which we did, and then needs a final. So I was thinking about that too. And then it's like this was approved, but now has changes. Correct. Right. Um, oh, yes. I would just say that condition 11 has been met. But don't we want to address the. Uh, site plan landscape plan as well as that because that's new material or or revised material one all right so does anybody have and 10 right i would say 10 and 11 there are other ones i think were in the last approval were noted to staff mm -hmm. but uh, we were uh, this ten was not really because it's a height change. Right. Is there any discussion about the height at this point? Well, I think they met the conditions that yes. we set out. So okay. yeah. If I could, my motion would be better stated, honestly, to the motion to approve the plan updates as presented. 
of which there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we have our, the plan updates. I could read them all, but we've discussed them. They were presented. So that would be a better motion than simply facade changes because is there a second? Would you? Okay, thank you. All right, so I'm Commissioner and can you repeat that, Todd? My motion would be better stated, and I would make to to motion to approve the plan updates as presented tonight in the agenda memo, of which we have nine bullet points, which I could read um, if you want me to. Why don't you go ahead? Okay. The building, the, the plan updates that we're presenting um, was the building footprint had been modified slightly at the south. East and southwest ends of the building. The divider wall on the southeast of the building has been shortened to avoid encroaching on the sidewalk. And the divider wall on the southwest end of the building has been removed. Number two is on site parking has been reduced from 63 to 62 spaces. With six additional on street parking spaces, the standard requires a total of 68 spaces and is met. Number three is 16 bike parking spaces are noted at the southwest end of the building and near the dumpster enclosure, and 12 spaces are indicated to the west. Of the courtyard entrance, the standard requires a minimum of 28 parking spaces and is met. The access to the green recorder has been removed. For uh, the next bullet point, four trees have been added to the southwest side of parking area. The street trees on Fulton Street have been replaced. Dwarf arborvitae have been added to either side of the Emmett Street parking lot entrance, and significant landscaping has been identified around the exterior of the building into the courtyard area. The next bullet point was facade changes along Emmett and Fulton Streets include the addition of window overhangs, stone sills, and stone headers. Door overhangs have been added to entrances along the courtyard. The next point is the parapet height has been increased two feet on the bump out portions of the building to help reduce visibility of rooftop equipment. The overall height of the building increased from 33 to 35 feet. The standard allows a maximum of 37 feet and is met. And the final point was exterior materials have been updated. And include lap vinyl siding, aluminum, wood stone siding, side panel system, veneer brick, vinyl windows, and composite trim and fashion. Okay, that makes a motion. Seconds it. And um, any more discussion? Yeah, well, I just want to point out that I think that sounds great, that motion, but I counted eight bullets. No, did I read that? Not, not nine. And correct that, that is as opposed to the 11 items under the condition approval. I'm not sure what the missing one is or the missing ones are. And that that is compared to Andrew's letter, which lists 12. So did we cover it? <laughs> okay. Just wanted to make sure we covered it. Right, so our approval tonight is on specifically on these changes that were presented, realizing there's some outstanding items that need to be completed, including the lighting plan and other things. Okay, roll call vote. Robson? Yes. Roma? Yes. Brada? Oh, sorry, Buck? Yes. Detmer? Yes. McSweeney? Yes. Meridian? Reluctantly, yes. Newman? Yes. Paul. Yes. I'm going to go and get uh, <laughs> No, I think it's fifty percent off. Oh. 
Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, the Planning Commission has uh, before it two ordinances. Uh, one is a ordinance to amend uh, the zoning code to that specifies which zoning districts short-term rentals would be located in. And the second ordinance is what is referred to as a police power ordinance, which doesn't require Planning Commission uh, approval, but it is a ordinance that would eventually go directly to the city council for their, their review and uh, revision or adoption. The, or, the two ordinances were reviewed. They were brought, they were reviewed initially at the last planning commission meeting and we decided uh, after discussion to create a subcommittee uh, which was the chair, uh, Commissioner Newman and Commissioner Wilmot, uh, and Lisa and I, and the five of us met a couple of weeks ago, and we reviewed and thoroughly went through and critiqued both of the ordinances. And then the, there were several other iterations done, but those were done via email uh, based on a few uh, wordsmithing uh, recommendations. We, after the final draft was prepared, uh, we sent it over to Matt Cross, who's the city attorney. And Matt took a look at it and he had a couple other little tweaks, but he said, and you, we, we attached his email. Uh, you know, he said, I think this is starting to look pretty good. So uh, I think I can speak for the committee, the subcommittee. I think we were kind of all pleased with the result of that process and and the result is actually the two ordinances that are uh, before the planning commission this evening. As I mentioned, the first one is, is a rather short ordinance. This is the one that specifies the zoning districts. Uh, the, the key portion of the key parts of this code is that the short-term rentals would be allowed in the B1, the B2, the B2A mixed use district, the B3, which is your central business district, and the B3A, which is resort commercial. Uh, we also, under the standards, uh, short-term rentals shall not be allowed in non-residential uh, commercial buildings, and uh, short-term rentals shall be located above the first floor of the principal building in those districts. And uh, those were the, and then the third was that Short-term rentals must meet the provisions of the zoning ordinance and the state building code and the international property maintenance code and fire code, and that the short-term rental shall be required to provide one off-street parking space for an efficiency or one bedroom unit and two parking spaces for two bedrooms or more, and shall meet the provisions of the off-street parking and driveway curb cut standards. And these are pretty much the parking standards for residential uses. So that's the zoning ordinance. And I don't know if you want to go one one at a time, Madam Chair. I would, but I wonder if it would be wise to do the piece of one first. We can. The second ordinance that we're going to do first is the police power, which is the, this is the licensing ordinance. This is the one that goes, that's that would be adopted as part of the Potosky Code of Ordinances. It goes into way more detail. It's got, first section is primarily all definitions. And we made sure that the definitions that are in the licensing agreement are the same ones that are in the zoning definitions. So there's no conflict on definitional use. Um, the second part is the licensing procedure itself, uh, which states that the short-term rental license is between April 1 and March 31. Uh, it, we have a procedure of when they, the licenses are renewed and they can commence on somebody that has a license can start the renewal process 
as early as November 1st. However, if they do not uh, go through the renewal process uh, prior to December 31, then their license would be, uh, if it's not submitted, it would expire. Uh, other provisions in here require uh, what the uh, application would include and uh, what the uh, documents that need to be submitted uh, to the city uh, for review. And those would include things like the current deed for the property and uh, who the ownership is. The way that the ordinance is set up, the ownership uh, is in the name of a person uh, and it's defined is the, the definition of a natural person is a human being because in corporate law, a, a person can be a corporation or a limited partnership. And the ordinance is set up that we do not want limited partnerships or corporations buying multiple pieces of property and licensing them for short-term rentals. So the license has to be in the name of the person. Uh, the cap, and that's the number of licenses that would be granted in any given year would be established by city council through resolution. So periodically there could be an annual review and that cap could increase or decrease, but that's a council decision. Um, we do have a provision in the ordinance that currently there are 33, uh, let me look at the number here. Uh, we have, 33, Lisa, or 34? 33. We have 33. We do have se several of those properties that are located in residential districts, and they would be grandfathered in as long as their license is maintained. So those are grandfathered. Uh, the other licenses would be solely uh, available for commercial, in commercial properties uh, above the, the first floor. We do have a provision in, in here that sets up a waiting list that if somebody applies for an application, but it, it, it uh, we're already at the cap, they would go onto a waiting list and that would be kept by city council or by city administration. And when a license becomes available, the first person on the waiting list would have an opportunity, second, third, and so forth. Uh, we do have a violation provision in here regarding a first violation as written warning. Second violation could result in a fine. A third violation, uh, there's a possibility that the license would be revoked. And if it is revoked, there is an appeal section that goes before the Zoning Board of Appeals where the person that has the revoked license can basically come and state their case why it should be renewed. But the, the short-term license ordinance that is under the police power is really the, the meat and bones of the, the short-term rental licensing program. The, the ordinance, the zoning ordinance, uh, uh, STR, basically defines what districts they can go in, so. Um, yes, um, I read this um, and uh, find it easy to read. Um, I think it's, Fairly thorough, although certainly listen to any input for things that could not be there. One question I had, um, grandfathering is mentioned, it's on page four, number nine. Um, it wasn't a definition, and I wondered if it should be, although in that section it does define what grandfathering is. So I, I, one question for you was, should that be in a definition or are you happy just defining it in the section number nine? I, I think it's... I don't want to speak for the committee, but I, we went through that and we thought it was pretty clear. Okay. But not the other clear. question I have on grandfathering is I'm, uh, I, I guess, personally used to um, that concept. So in grandfathering these uh, existing, they're essentially, in my mind, a non-conforming use. Um, and I was wondering if there would be a provision that when the property was sold, that would go away. Uh, I believe in the licensing, it's in here. Okay, it's number 15, okay. page 5, it's line 206. Okay, I missed that. When a licensed property is transferred, the license will expire upon okay. the transfer of the property. And that's for the grandfathered ones as well. Like yeah, that's it. Yes. Okay. Any, any car. Well, any licensed car. 
in the commercial, it still would happen, but the next yeah. one then could apply. Yeah. I, I just wonder in that section, again, I'm back to number nine, that point on page four, the term grandfathering comes in in the middle of the paragraph. So it's a little hard to find it. Well, it's at the end actually. Um, and it's a kind of an important part of this for just for someone reading this. And then in that section nine, nowhere does it say what it says in 15, that that's gonna go, the grandfathering is only gonna exist until such time as um, the property is transferred. I wonder if it would, again, that's like, I'm just trying to think of someone trying to read this and understand it and really get the picture. Cause that, I, that, I certainly don't have a problem creating yeah. a definition of what grandfather means in, in the, in, in this. Uh, if that if that provides greater clarity, we can insert a definition of what grandfather means, and then we would refer to it as it's basically grandfather means it's non-conforming relative to the uh, scope of the ordinance. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted for the commission, whatever people think, obviously, but in number nine, if it if we restated that number fifteen, basically the sentence that when the property is transferred, that the grandfathering uh, would cease. Well, the transfer, yeah, the transfer applies to all licenses, whether it's grandfathered or not. Right, but if it was a grandfathered property, you uh, you can't it, reapply. You couldn't reapply. Right, right, because it's not. It's because it's not it's, it's, it's kind of it's just like kind of a big deal to know. For when, sure. Yeah. Okay, so what, what I understand, Commissioner, is that I know it's clear eventually. It, it's you wanted to add it into number nine that a a grandfathered parcel property that's transferred. The license will expire. You just want to re you want to emphasize right. that. So when someone's reading that, they get that whole picture right there. Not that they remember when they get to number fifteen. Yep, that's fine. Yeah, that was my only. And if I may, because I think I I, I kind of concur is you know the point there is that that nonconforming use will no longer be allowed by in, in the future in the future. Yeah. Can do. Okay, Charlie. Uh, mine is a uh, John is a, is a uh, process question. Um, if we are to consider uh, sending this to public hearing at our next meeting, would we be uh, doing a public hearing on both of these or just the policing power with? This ordinance being a uh, recommendation by resolution to city council directly. The ordinance that specifies the districts stays at the PC and is subject to public hearing. The licensing ordinance, you would make a recommendation to council. They would be the ones that hold the public hearing. So the policing power, what we refer to as the long one, the, the long guts of it, is what's going to council. Oh, council. Yes, and they they make they hold the public hearing because it would be part of the city code of ordinances. Okay. So they hold the public hearing. You hold the public hearing on the on the zoning ordinance that establishes what districts they go in. Okay. And along with that recommendation to city council for uh, the the licensing. Uh, language, uh, would we also be making a separate resolution for the number of the cap? I think the planning commission should make a recommendation to council on what you think the cap should be. It's their policy to establish the cap, but you can provide input. And, and along with that number should be some rationale for why we pick the number, right? It, and I, in the I believe it was in your packet. There was a letter that talked about the rationale for it. Okay, great. Yeah. Unfortunately, we got that today. So people haven't had a chance to study it. But uh, what I'd like to do right now is just focus on the police power. Doug. This is actually related to the amendment. Should I wait? Uh, I have a, a question related to the, the amendment. Should I wait until we're... The amendment for the zoning? Yeah, I just said, I, so one police power is the seven page one. Okay. And the zoning is the two page one. Right. So I, I did have a question related to the amendments. 
But you just mentioned the police zoning. So I didn't want to go out of order if you want to okay, talk about Okay, I guess I'm confused what the amendment is. What do you mean by amendment? The, the zoning. Yeah. Okay. The zoning order. We're going to get to that. Okay. Right now we're just focusing on the police power. And with this one, um, we're, this can be our final night looking at this if we decide it's adequate um, and it could get passed on to city council at their next meeting. If we feel like things need to be added, you know, and it's a big change, then it would have to stay with us, I believe. So um, any other discussion, comments? We're adding the grandfathered and property transfer explanation in number nine. Um, I will tell you that we deleted some sections. We deleted 15, six exceptions and exemptions. And that was, uh, had to do with a dwelling unit does not need a short-term rental license. And that was for family occupancy, house sitting, dwelling sales and estate representative. And we decided that wasn't necessary because we had defined short-term rental as a, you know, renting something for 30 days or less. And so we didn't feel that these exemptions needed to be addressed. Since we have the, the uh, it's 30 days or, or less and you receive compensation. But I don't know if anybody else has a different opinion on that. And the other thing we um, reworked was the maximum occupancy. We had stated it was so many bedrooms per, um, so many occupants per bedroom and then so many occupants in addition per floor. We dropped all that and said that the, the fire, uh, how did we put it? The public safety would determine what the safe occupancy would be. And we also added maximum occupancy, which means not only the occupants, but their guests. Um, one of the things we want to avoid is a large event taking place in an STR. And of course, you know, I mean, houses, they can't always, if you have a lot of people there, they're not going to be able, the bathrooms can't support and, and all that. So we added those things. And we also added uh, for a bedroom uh, uh, definition, we said a bedroom has to include a second egress opening which should be obvious for fire code, but we state it very clearly in the ordinance, including what basements need to be if they're, if they're included. So does anybody feel that we, oh, the other thing we, we uh, deleted was the, the complainant requirements. Um, you know, if a uh, complainant files a false report, it, it, it said how they would get a hold of things. But we also decided this was for the licensee and um, that we are including, uh, Charlie suggested this, and I think it was uh, a good addition that in their rental um, document, you know, the lease, has to include the, some city ordinance information. So, you know, our fireworks, trash, police, noise, that's right in, they have to include that in their lease language. So that helps the, the renter understand. So that was also added. And I think the logic was when we, uh, besides it didn't seem appropriate in this document is that because they're city ordinances, it would be handled just like any other complaint. My only question, John, is that if somebody makes a complaint and the police show up and address it and just talk to the people and leave, uh, or the local agent addresses it, when does it become an infraction? When it makes its when it makes its way to city hall. So if uh, uh, if a, 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 a resident, a neighbor filed a complaint and the enforcement officer went out and confirmed it, or if public safety was called for, for noise, or if that, if that complaint or that infraction was then uh, made its way to the uh, 
zoning administrator and the code enforcement officer, then that would be the first infraction and they would, they would receive a written notice. Okay. So it would really be up to the police whether they filed something or Correct. just gave them a, they had a conversation. So I guess I was not clear with that explanation. If an officer goes out, but there's no citation, for, for example, if an officer went out, a neighborhood a neighbor complained that somebody was parking in front of their house in the street, and the officer went out and said, "Hey, you know, move your car." To me, that's that that's not a big deal. But if if somebody had a, a band or had a stereo system and they were playing loud music until one o'clock in the morning, and the neighbors called and the public safety went out, I would expect that public safety then would notify zoning administrator and the code enforcement officer. And then that would be a, they, the, the licensee would receive a written warning saying, don't do that again. So there, there's, there's a little bit of, you know, discretion that's okay. applied on the degree. So is there anything else that anybody believes needs to be added? Okay. Are we ready to make a rec recommendation to city council as is? Or would these proposed revisions? Right. I did have one other question. When they say how the um, uh, the application can be received, uh, it mentions U.S. mail or handing in in person. So. Fax, email, or is there any reason why that couldn't be done? Sometimes because of the, uh, there may be issues regarding the, uh, the timestamp. For example, if somebody emails it in after five o'clock when city hall's closed or the end date's a Friday and they email it on Saturday, they, they could say, well, I sent my email City Hall was closed, it should still be considered. This has kind of been debated in a lot of communities I've worked in. And they've said, look, you got two options. You can hand deliver it or you send it by mail because the mail's got a timestamp on it. Okay, so what about FedEx? FedEx, fine. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Well, I figured it was a person that would hand it off to somebody. Yeah. So, all right. All right, is somebody ready to make a motion? Question Do they not the pleading but the ordinance changes? Once we make those changes, it goes to the public hearing with us, yes. Right, so do we wait until we do our public hearing and approve that before we send the policing to city council? Um, yeah. I, so I think they get one pass by or we get it yeah. Oh, um, well, I leave. I, I turn to John. Okay, I, I, I would recommend that we 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 act on these separately uh we need to i think you we need to get something in front of city council so we have some rules and regulations um and i'm sure that when it gets to them they may have some changes but those changes will be between them and the city attorney and you know myself or the city manager at that point in time but i, I think we gotta we we we, we have to divide these and just get them moving in the right direction. Right, and you've pointed out that there currently are short-term rentals in town. Yes. So this would apply. Yes. So short of us passing, yeah. Yep. Okay. Charlie? Should the motion be made in the form of a, just a recommendation or a resolution or what, what, what process should be? I've got, I, I have, in my cover letter, okay. I have a proposed motion for the ordinance to, to amend the city code for your consideration. Right. Um, before we do that, I, I open up to the public if the public would like to comment. And state your name and address. Uh, my name is Christopher Terry. Um, I live in Upper Springs, but uh, my wife and I actually have four of the 33 of the two short term rental licenses. Uh, we own business in the Business that called Little Bay Cottage. Um, my only concern 
we are a, an actual business in the business district, um, would be the same provision you guys discussed with regard to the transfer. Our concern would be this um, if we were to sell the, our business, our property, um, unfortunately, much like if you were to buy a restaurant and expect to have a liquor license go with that, you wouldn't buy a restaurant unless you had a liquor license. The reality would be when you buy a rental, knowing you're going to be put to the back of the line and therefore possibly miss out on the actual business that you were looking to buy. So that would be my concern about the same provision, which would be uh, 15 when the property license is transferred. Because we're not grandfathered in our business, hopefully in the central business district will remain uh, have the ability to, to be a short-term rental. The concern is if we ever want to sell that business, the new owner would eventually essentially or could be put to the end of the line. May I? Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll give you my answer uh, is that in, I try to make the distinction that a short term rental is a license, it's not an asset. And a, a piece of property that's used as short term rental, its, it's primary use is residential, uh, not a short term rental. Uh, so when the property transfers or is sold, then it's, it's sold with the intention that it's going to be a residential unit because it's actually non-conforming in the residential district. It's not residential. It's in the business district. It's oh. in the central business B2. district. It's in B2. It is. It's a commercial building. Which, what's the property? It's a little big cottage. It's right there. On oh, yeah, that, that one we've discussed. Okay. Yeah, that one we consider in the business district. But the concern is under the ordinance is that the, is that the license will not transfer with it. So therefore, we have been told Forgive me if I'm wrong. So we have been told that unfortunately any potential owner would then be put to the back of the line. And that unfortunately would make, unless we were any owners and we plan it, we love you know, the city, we live here. But the reality is, is that unless we continue to maintain the ownership and we will have to be there every first of November, don't worry, but at the same yeah. time. Lisa, refresh my memory. We did talk about that's the one on Wakazoo. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> And I, I think our our interpretation of that was was that that could be sold as a short term rental because hotels and motels technically are allowed in that district with special approval. It is a lot. It is a permitted. It is a permitted use. Correct. So you you kind of have an exception on the, on the Walk Azul one because of the location in the CBD. Would we need to? Make an application at the hotel. I mean, we are for you. No, no, we don't want to do that. But okay. we, it, this is an unusual circumstance. It, it, it is. Yeah. You know, you've got four units. It's in the business district, Wakazoo, and we know that it's short-term rentals, and it's just it, that's quirk, quirky. What we're really getting at, in terms of the grandfather, are the units that are in residential zone districts. Unfortunately, the lawyers, so I'm yeah. language. Sure. The language doesn't. The language says that if we transfer it from Kristen Mar and Perry to John Smith, that John Smith will no longer have a license. And the concern I have with the ordinance is that John Smith will be put to the end of the line. No, you're not in that interpretation, you are correct. They will be. The way the way this is set up is that when you sell it to another party, that license does not transfer. That that person buys the property, they if the if they're a, if the cap is available or under the cap. They can apply for the license. If they apply for the license and it's at the cap, then they go onto the waiting list. So you you read it correctly. And, and that's my concern. I guess if, if I need to go on a restaurant, they have a liquor license, and I understand it's not the same equivalent, but you wouldn't be able to sell your license if you didn't have, you wouldn't be able to sell your restaurant if you couldn't guarantee the owner the ability to serve alcohol and beverages under the license you currently have. Right. Where in many cases, liquor licenses are transferable. I guess what I'm saying is, is that that is our concern about this, is that it's not transferable. I mean, if you're saying that that's not going to be the case, well, I guess I'm just trying to bring that up as a potential. I'm saying that you, you, can, you can sell it under the pretense that it's a short-term rental. The person you're selling it to has to understand that if there are licenses available, they can apply. If there aren't licenses available, they can apply and go on the waiting list. So, just a question, but since it's an existing short-term rental licensed, it's one of those, however many licenses that were approved by, would be approved by city council, 
and it would already be licensed. So, isn't wouldn't there couldn't there be a mechanism that would allow non-conforming well in, in properties to just maintain that license? In his case, based on how this is set up, what's that? But I'll remind you of the discussion. We are allowing short term rentals on the second story, story. of commercial Three buildings, buildings, and you have short term rentals on the main floor. So here we only have one floor. So. Oh, it's only one yeah, floor. Floor. That's going to be something that when you get to the next ordinance, we're going to have to ask for a variance, right. I guess, at some point in time, because we only have one floor. So, I mean, the second floor is one unit, right? I'm sorry. Okay. So you have one unit up and two units down. Three units down, one unit up. Okay. So it's a unique, based on, it's a unique piece of property, and I, I'm sorry to bring out our, our personal concerns, but unfortunately. Right. Um, but it, the, the concern is, is that because it's such a unique building and it's smack dab in the business district, mm -hmm. we like being good stewards of the city of Petoskey. We hope we're we hope we're helping. I know short term rentals sometimes get a bad. Uh, wrap, but the reality is we hope we're helping bring business to the city, and at the same time, I don't know if we're going to want to stay with it forever, so to speak. And the concern is, is that if I can't, I can't promise somebody a license, then it becomes potentially unsellable, other than the value of the property itself. But then you get into what would somebody else do with that piece of property? That's our answer. Well, it has four permits, right? It, it's us, correct? Yeah. So it can be sold as a rental property, which diminishes its value significantly. So I, I know that's not your problem. I guess I'm just I'm, I'm bringing that up for public comment. That's why I'm here. Okay. I just want to say I, I I think it's an interesting point, and my perspective is what what are we trying to do with this ordinance and um, define districts where these properties can go, um, keeping them out of residential areas. Um, and then potentially setting a cap on the number in the city uh, is the other discussion. In addition to having better requirements and mm -hmm. all the things that go along with doing this. So I personally don't have a huge interest in taking one away that's in a district that's fine if just because it gets sold. I, I somewhat agree with that point, actually. I don't I mean people, I, you know, that wasn't, on my radar for things I wanted to achieve in this ordinance. It's all the other things. Well, the, the problem is what's best in the commercial space. Um, and we've had this discussion about allowing living space on the first floor mm -hmm. and our commercial space, we want the first floor to be commercial. So therefore that's one reason why we said they can be on the second story up. They can't be on the first story. So this house is is just doesn't, what is it, a square peg trying to fit into a round hole? It's the exception, but it's the only one. Yeah. And I, I can argue that because okay. there are other buildings on that street that were houses that were converted to offices, but could be mm -hmm. converted back to rentals. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's that one, and then there's another one across the street mm -hmm. on Mitchell, and then there's Scotland. There's a couple more in there. So Converting to rental is one thing. Converting to short-term rental is another. Right. And that's what we're trying to go on. Any other? Not on the first floor, they couldn't. But you can argue that it's not a commercial building. It's a residential building. So there's also... I'm, not, I'm just saying I'm not quite sure. Is, is there any way to structure a, a variance for this particular property? No, I think you're going to have to talk to the city attorney about how you would want to craft the, the ordinance or that provision. Bottom line is we don't want to set a precedent and allow short-term rentals on the first floor in a business district because what's going to happen then is that any business, any commercial property on Mitchell or any of the other commercial streets could be sold for short-term rentals. Mm. And then you're, you're giving up your retail space. So you got to be very careful with this. This is the walk of zoo is, is a unique one, but you know, my, my, I guess my position is I understand it's a short term rental. I understand it's an income producing property for the, for this couple, but the bottom line is it's, it's actually an apartment house that is in, that happens to be in the business district. 
Good uh, question. It wasn't um, wasn't built as a short term rental. It was converted into a short term rental. It was it was actually at some point a residential home. Right. So your point is that res residential homes used to exist in the central business district. Well, yeah, sure. But if they sell, other than possibly getting sent to the end of the line, they would still be able to have a short-term rental on the first floor of that specific? No, it's that's, that's not conforming. I mean, I mean we have to so have they would only have one short-term rental in there? Yeah, they, they could use the other three for, for an apartment for rental, like a typical rental, then the one up on the second floor could be a short-term rental. push the green button, please? Sure. Okay. Could I please make a comment? I'm Marin Carey. Uh, co-owner of 414 Wakasu Little Bay Cottage. Another thing that I think might be helpful to be pointed out with this is that of our four apartments, the largest one is 595 square feet. The second largest is 440 square, uh, 460, 440 square feet, and then 350 square feet. These are small places where I would argue are not suitable necessarily for long-term renting. We're not, they're vacation spots. They were not divided that way. We bought, we bought the building in that, in that way. Um, the previous owner had long-term renters pursuant to a Mr. Loan they received to rehabilitate the property. And it was a mess with one person living in 350 square feet. It was a mess. We have no private parking of our own. So perhaps there's a square footage requirement. I don't know what the city ordinance is for square footage requirements for, for long-term dwelling spaces. And if that's something that can be considered here. My recommendation to the planning commission is- My recommendation to the planning commission is move it on to the council. And then in between, when it's in between planning commission and council, I'll have a conversation with the city attorney about how he, he feels we should craft it regarding this situation. But I don't want to I don't want to create a situation where we establish a precedent, which then opens up the rest of the business districts for short term rental. I just recommend that we don't do that. Well, and that short term rental on the first, on the first floor. floor. Right. So this is unique, but then I would like to talk to Matt about it mm -hmm. in terms of what his what his uh, uh, what, how he would envision right. trying to resolve this. I would also say that for the first floor, they're in, you're in central business district. Correct. So we don't allow residential on the first floor. So I wonder, even if that was allowed to go back to long-term rental, how it, it, I know it's unique and if, well, to not conforming use. Right. right. So how do we, we can't, once, how does that work? If uh, if that were to be sold, then does the non conforming use, it stays with the property? Or if it's sold, it's no longer that? Well, you've got two different issues going on. You've got a house that's in the CBD that it can still be sold and still be non conforming. But in their, their case, they've overlaid a short-term rental on top of it, which the ordinance says, the short-term rental ordinance says, if they sell it, the license expires, and then the new person has to either use an existing one on their cap or go on the waiting list. So you've got two different things going on. Mm -hmm. okay. You've got a non-conformity. You've got a residence in the business district, which is non-conforming, and then you've got the short-term rental on top of it. That's why I need to talk to the city attorney about how he wants to craft it. I just feel if we send it on, for my part, I would like it to somehow state that I, I understand and hear this issue and I would like to find a way to potentially, if possible, make it work. I, I think it is a house in the CBD. They didn't make this thing. They didn't rip down a commercial building and put a house there with short-term rentals. Right. It's part of the fabric of Petoskey. I totally agree that first floor um, commercial is what we want in the CBD. Although people have argued about, you know, stores that sell things versus um, commercial entities that are more businesses and don't have a sidewalk appeal, if you will. 
So this wouldn't have sidewalk appeal for shoppers. It's on the end, but it certainly has people using the CBD. So it's kind of a neat thing to have in that respect. So I don't know. I just hope if we pass it on. To I'll pass it on to Matt, but I also want to pass along the, the issue of the of the transfer of the license. We you can't get into a position where we craft an ordinance specifically to allow them, them only be able to, to put the property up for sale as a short-term rental and say, oh, by the way, the license comes with it, where the other people that are licensed have to fall under the ordinance that if they sell the property, that license expires, and then they've got to go on the waiter list. And it's the other part of it is, we don't know what that cap is yet, and we don't know really how many short-term rentals right. are out there. We know that there's 33, but my bet is that there's more than what we think is that it's not going to be fair to the people on the waiting list if somebody that owns a short-term rental mm -hmm. can sell it as a short-term rental because then they're never going to have the ability or the opportunity to, you know, use to, to, to get a license. So we're kind of, in a way, uh, kind of creating a monopoly in a way. By That's the whole purpose of when you transfer, when you sell a property that's an STR, the people can buy it as STR, but they have to apply. And if there's no licenses available, then their license goes into the waiting list. Well, a couple of things. I think the most likely scenario is often these things would be on for some period of time. Correct. And um, the other thing is they certainly wouldn't make an exception for these people. But if this situation could be legally adequately defined in a narrow way, that's what my interest is. Could and, this... and that's what I'll discuss with the city attorney. Because I think we got two issues here. We got a house in the business district, which is not conforming. And then, we, then it's being used as a short term rental. And their position is when they get ready to sell, they would like to sell it as a short term rental and have the license uh, be transferred over to the new owner, which is inconsistent with how the ordinance is set up. Right. And that kind of sets then a precedent for other people going, well, why do I have to give up? Why can't I sell my property as a short term rental? The, 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 the strategy here is to put a cap on STRs so it reduces the amount of speculation that goes on in a community where people are coming in and just buying houses with the intent of trying to get a short-term rental license. And they're taking houses off the market that could be used either as long-term rentals or as uh, owner property. That's part of the housing dilemma that many communities are facing with, with this competition with the STRs is that there's not enough supply and there's this artificial demand going on that's being caused by the number of short-term rentals that are being converted. I mean, right now in Petoskey, we only know of 33. We'll know of more. You know, that's about one, maybe 2% of your housing stock. But in the analysis that we did, a lot of communities are already at five and 6% of their housing stock is being used for short-term rentals. And- Well, you care about what you did. You're right, there's a lot of residential homes that people are using their short-term rentals, let's face it, illegally, or to use a better term, this is, this is not that situation, and nor is anything in the business district that situation. You're right, people buying a home you know, up, up on uh, whatever, Petoskey Street, uh, not in the business district, shouldn't be using their home as a short-term rental. I, we would not have done that. What is 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 where we're located. I think that's just what the uniqueness about it. And I appreciate you wanting to talk to the to the city attorney about it. I'm 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 the concern is again, and the same goes back to the second ordinance while we're talking about it is the first floor, which of course I probably come up again and talk to you again about, but um you know, we find ourselves to be a unique piece of property. I, I guess that would be my only the, that the second issue that you brought up about first floor that to me is something that could be resolved at the zoning board of appeals because you have an existing home that was built with first floor residents and it, it, it happens to be non-conforming. And even if you used it as a long-term rental, it wouldn't be consistent with the, with the city code. So there, there has to be some uh, uh, leeway there relative. And that's the reason for, I could see that part going to the zoning board for variance, just based on the historic context of the building in the downtown. So that one, I think, is resolved. John, going back to the first issue, 
um, is there any merit to considering uh, uh, terminating the license for anything that's in a non-conforming district, but allowing renewal of the license as a priority for uh, after a sale of a property in the conforming district? So you know, anything anything in commercial districts that's above the first floor allow that to happen. A lot. Well, I mean, there may there should be parameters to it. But uh, yeah, we're well, yeah. not a total ban like in the residential. Right. Uh, if if I owned a business, a downtown building, a commercial building that had a short term rental on the second or third floor. Right. Okay. Exactly. And then I sold the building. Okay. Those short term rental licenses would be. They would expire, and the people buying the building would have to reapply. Right. I mean, that's the, the end of the line. Yes, because it's a conforming use and an existing. But I know. It, but if we we establish a priority system, right? Then again, that's very discretionary, and it's like the, the it's un, it would it's it would be unfair to the people that are on the waiting list that they keep keep, keep getting pushed down. Because of that issue, well, they, they so, don't have the opportunity because the license already exists and, and it's in somebody else's name. So I guess I would say who's hiring more? There's someone on the waiting list who would like to get into the short-term rental business and they're hoping to do it. They're sitting there waiting. They're maybe they're renting it out long term, or someone who has, you know, an existing use like that would has a property with some value and they like to sell it that way. I just for me, it doesn't bother me. I don't care who owns I, I like the cap and i like um not allowing grandfathering at sales in residential neighborhoods that's my main well first for a commercial in general for the cdd yes although this is an interesting example <laughs> but it already exists if the continued owners continue to reapply the rating list never gets right. filled so right. that, that so, no, no. i'm hearing the planning community uh, Rick, hopefully i'm hearing what you're saying is that if you want a commercial property with a short term rental on the second or third floor, you can sell that building with the idea that the, the short term rental license will transfer to the new property owner? No. Is that what you were talking about? Well, they would be given priority. They wouldn't have to go to the bottom of the list. Let's put right. it that way. When, when the renewals happen on an annual basis, because one of those properties had already been licensed like that, they would automatically be licensed if they if the new owner met all the criteria of of the reapplication the annual reapplication i think that's all right yeah. Child was the that's, yeah. all right i'd like to add another scenario if it because people who own buildings rent the space so say someone rents the upper story and turns them into short-term rentals and they have a, a, you know, a lease, a long-term lease, and the owner of the building sells the building. Does that renter lose the short-term rental license? Right. <laughs> yeah, that uh, the rent sounds like a good let me, let me say this. I've been with communities that have taken five years to do a short-term rental license. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is, like this gentleman, everyone that owns a short-term rental is going to have a different scenario that they're going to want you to incorporate in the ordinance. You, you have to make an ordinance that is pretty much uniform across the line, right? Uh, when, when I bought it, when I buy a car and I have a driver's license, if I sell that car to my daughter, my driver's license doesn't go to her. She's got to get her own license. And that's the same thing with a short-term rental. It's a license. It's not, it's not part of the asset of the property. It's, it's a license to use the property for a short-term rental for that year, unless that application is renewed. All right? Once you start making different uh, exceptions, we're, we're never, we're, this, I can tell you that the city's never going to have a short-term rental ordinance, and there's no way we're going to be able to manage this at the community level. So you're saying there's no possibility that the ordinance would simply say that in conforming districts, 
that a license can transfer okay. with this. Yeah. You know, you have to apply for that same um, application approval within 30 days of the sale of it. Right. And then if you don't apply, then you get picked up again. Right. Bottom. You could do that, couldn't you? I mean, if, if we wanted to. I want to talk to the attorney because if 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 we I, my my concern is if we allow that in the commercial district, then what's the person in the residential district that has a grandfathered property? I can see them saying, "Wait a minute! If you're doing it for commercial property, I should be able to sell my short-term rental house and have 30 days to re have the person right. renew their license." I'm just concerned. And that's why I want to talk to the. Well, yeah, I asked the question. Have you seen the conforming, non conforming are two different situations that can be defined? Yes, it is. To a, to a property right. owner that has a short term rental in a residential district, maybe not so much. Mm -hmm. So I, I just, be, I want to explore, I'd like to explore yeah. this situation with the attorney within the context of the ordinance. If I could just add just the one thing, uh, I think the point was made in the, in the public comments, but. If you can't transfer that license, does that discourage the investment that the current owner has into that property? So would there be higher quality units in terms of the capital that's put into these uh, uh, this, these units that would otherwise maybe not be utilized because they're upstairs? And, and so um, by... By not being able to transfer the license, you certainly are discouraging the current owner from putting um, additional funds or the minimum amount of funds into that into that property because of the investment horizon. Well, I would respond to that by saying in the residential districts, we're not talking I don't about care. It. We're not just well, there is a there, you're absolutely right. There's a fundamental difference that, that I think we're debating here between the residential districts grandfathered. And the commercial districts, not just the grandfathered ones, but the ones that are conforming use licenses as well. So uh, I, I, I think if John talks to the city attorney, um, he'll get a thorough review. And I would urge us to nevertheless move this ordinance forward to city council uh, in the interest of uh, getting something done. Uh, to protect the city from uh, an influx of short-term rentals, and which already may be happening as we begin to do more investigations. Well, I will say that the grandfather ones are properly licensed, and we know about them. So any current short-term rental that is not licensed will not be able to continue. Only the ones that are properly licensed now. But this pending ordinance really helps reinforce that and put some teeth into it for mm -hmm. a future enforcement officer. That right. they, it would be very difficult to enforce. Yes. Thank you. I agree with John that um, that we need to be very careful and that uh, allowing living space. I don't know how quite how to put this to be with short term rentals, the ability to make money um, is very attractive, but it also means that we don't, there's a higher priority for short term rentals than there are for uh, workforce housing. Absolutely. And we don't want that to compete. So I, I do see the value of um, not transferring. Uh, in other words, you can have short-term rentals, but it it uh, the incentive shouldn't be that you create it and then you sell it for as a money maker, because that just raises the prices of all real estate when you do that. So, um, Madam Chair, just so I I'm very clear when I talk to Matt, you want me to talk about the Wakazoo issue mm -hmm. and then you want me to ask talk to Matt about help me if I'm wrong that if there is a conforming property property in a commercial district that meets all the standards and that property be sold scenario one is can the license be transferred with the sale or two 
and the license be they go on they go into the waiting list, but they go into a priority status. Is that what I was hearing? I'm, I don't want to misrepresent what the planning commission wants me to talk to the, the attorney about. Well, what I heard was that uh, prior to closing uh, and the, uh, the termination of the license, that the property owner be given 30 days for the new property owner to apply and qualify for transfer of the license. I think that's the cleanest way. Okay. And no, there was no effect on the waiting list at all. Not the front of the line, not the back of the line, no waiting list at all. Okay. Ready so are you, are you saying we don't have a waiting list then? No, we have a waiting list okay. for properties that become available in conforming districts. If they don't, um, if they're transferred within 30 days, they have to go on the waiting list. Right. Yeah, and, 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 and just so you know, the, the property on Walker Zoo is not considered grandfather. Okay, it's, that's not one of the grandfather properties. Well, so the first floor right. would be different, would be treated differently than the second floor. It's, 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 it's not on the grandfather oh, list, according right. to the city. And no, there's an exception. But they're in the central business district, they're exempt from parking. So they would be exempt from the parking yeah, right. Right. Okay, got the two questions. I'll I'll address them with Matt. All right. So, shall we um, uh, proceed with the proposed motion for the uh, city code for the police power? I'd be happy to make a motion. Is it go ahead? Um, motion to recommend that the city council consider the proposed short-term rental ordinance for adoption. It establishes the licensing, occupancy, wait list, and enforcement provisions affecting the use of property for short-term rentals in the city of Petoskey, along with an accompanying explanation from the planner and the uh, and the city attorney regarding uh, possible alternatives. Okay, and there were a couple proposed revisions as well. Yes, for number nine. A definite the addition of a definition and the addition of that uh, and the addition of the definition of grandfather and uh appropriate language changes in uh paragraph section nine. nine. Yeah, section stating nine. that the license when grandfathered property they lose the license when grandfathered property is transferred. There's no renewal of the license, no future. I need clarity on the middle part of what I'm what I'm voting on in okay. terms of the Am I voting on what is written here in front of me with the addition of the grandfather language? The grandfather definition, I'm sorry. The grandfather definition, uh, the, uh, the language that was uh, added to section nine to further clarify grandfathering situations. And uh, the fact that the uh, planner and the city attorney will be will look at certain key object uh, alternatives for the commercial district let me, let me summarize the four actions action number one in the motion would be the insert the definition of grandfather uh modify on page four section nine that when a license of a grandfathered property transfers the license shall expire with the transfer and then the two 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 uh items for the attorney one uh, on conforming properties and the transfer with sale and the licenses within 30 days. Uh, if they're applied within 30 days, can they uh, transfer with the property or they expire? And then the fourth issue is the particular issue that we have with Wakazoo. Those are the four, four items. Meaning first four. Yes. Yeah. And so, and if, again, I'm sorry for clarity. So, voting in favor of this is in support of the transferability of a conforming license. No, it's, with some with some thirty day. We're kicking it to the city council. Your uh, commissioner, what what you're uh, what you're going to approve, uh, what you're passing is the current ordinance as it's in front of you with the four with the two changes grandfather definition. Changing section nine on page four. Those are the two uh, contextual changes. 
Number three is in four are issues that I'll bring before the attorney that'll make their way to the city council. And that's the walk zoo first floor and confirming properties that sell, that if the, if, the, uh, if the seller, if the buyer within 30 days applies for a license, it can transfer. If they don't within 30 days, the license, the license would expire. And I'll get with the attorney on how to craft that appropriate language. I guess I'd just like to, and maybe we're saying the same thing. I'm not sure there's consensus that if, if that language was acceptable, acceptable to an attorney and to be incorporated here into this document, I'm not sure there's necessary consensus on the commission in support of that. And I would just hate, or I don't want the city council to infer because we're asking this point, if it's even possible that that there's a general consensus for that. Well, if, if that is part of the commissioner's motion about the transfer of conforming, if a conforming property sells, the buyer has 30 days to apply for a license or the license expires. If that's part of the motion, then when, when, the, when, the, when the commission takes the vote, you'll make that decision if there's consensus or not. Well, and furthermore, this is uh, uh, this is we're not doing a public hearing on this one. Council is council is going to do a public hearing on this. So all we're doing is giving them more information on this on this question, because ultimately they're going to decide the entirety of this document of this uh, ordinance, uh, regardless of what our recommendation is. Um, I would like to say that. Uh, if my vote yes is that I'm for the I transfer. Was, I was just, Madam Chairman, I was just going to say, to make it clean, why doesn't the Planning Commission do a consensus vote up or down if you're comfortable with the idea that if a conforming property sells, that the buyer within 30 days has the opportunity to apply for a license, and if they don't, then it expires. Okay, so I mean, if if you vote, if you do a consensus vote on that, then I can tell the attorney that would be the okay. that would be the, the 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 consensus of the planning commission to create that type of language. I just have to say I would hate to vote on that particular point without an attorney opinion, because I could feel one way now that I'm kind of inclined to allow that. Um, attorney could say it's a no brainer, it's fine. He could say you can put that in. But there's a chance that could be challenged that could undermine, in which case I might vote differently. You've suggested a conservative approach to not mudding the water. So I feel like I need the opinion on that. I don't disagree with that. What if we were to send this on with the caveat that we want to explore that? This issue with the attorney would go directly to counsel. Right, right. Yeah. And so with all due respect to your idea of consensus, it doesn't really matter when we vote on advancing it to council, that's your consensus. That's if they have an objection to my motion as stated, they'll vote against it. That's it there too. Well, couldn't we do just a consensus vote on that piece of it? So that you can't, I mean, what you're, 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 all you're doing is telling me to get with the attorney on the conforming property transfer option. Right. I don't know how, how he's going to opine on that. Mm -hmm. You're just telling me to get with him on that. And if he thinks it's doable, then it'll get inserted in the ordinance when it gets to the city council. If he feels it's not doable, then it won't show up in the ordinance. That's well, I would like it to be presented as what is in the best interest for the city in making this decision. So presumably, Presumably, Cynthia, that's the main right. consideration of the city council. Right. It's, at this point, we need to present draft language. Mm -hmm. Then this one is no longer in our camp. Okay, we need to move on to this. Yeah, I agree. This one is the, the next one is the one we need to hold the public hearing on and right. live or die on that mountain as we get there. You know? Okay. So are we waiting for a second? Uh, yeah. We had a first. Okay. I will second your motion. Okay. I will second Charlie's motion. All right. So Bethany made the second. Charlie made the motion. And we'll call vote. A discussion. Oh, I just, discussion. Just okay. had a question. So 
in line with what some of the other people have said. Um, so if it, I, I'm in favor of this going to the city council in this regard, basically what we're planning on doing. I just, you, you said you would just insert it. And I was thinking more, it would be the planning commissioners asked this question, the city attorney has, so council would get basically what we have with the two corrections we talked about or changes in nine. And then they would get a separate paragraph stating that this issue came up, some commissioners, you know, yes. we, we didn't have a legal opinion. So I'm not going to put it in there. So someone could just pick it up and say, well, they be confused about what they did. So you guys should decide now based on a legal opinion, further public comment, the best interest of the city, what, what you should do. Just so it's really clear to them, we didn't. That's how, it, does that make sense? Yeah, and that's my, con I, I guess I would be, I'd be concerned if, if after consulting uh, city council, uh, or I'm sorry, the city attorney, that language that I, I hadn't reviewed was inserted into, right. into, into this document. Right. I'd like, I would prefer that to be removed, moved from the, the changes of this document and, and then just add as additional consideration you know, city council may want to consider yeah. that that yeah. aspect. All right. Is that but the whole aspect that we're moving on to city council is is kind of at their discretion all the way around. I mean, it they is. could change anything in there. But I think just in the presentation, I think the concern is that it's very exceedingly clear. We have one council member here, but it's exceedingly clear what we had before us and what we were talking about more theoretically. That's what gets woven in. Just so it's clear. I got that approach. So, John, do you, uh, motion. Are you, do we put a second motion on the no. No. proceeds? Are you, would you be willing to drop that and then we do a second motion with no. that recommendation? The motion stands. I, I, I request a motion. Yeah, I, I'm pretty clear on what, what the direction of the planning commission is. Okay. Any other discussion? Roll call vote. Braddock? Yes. Buck? Yes. Detmer? Yes. McSweeney? Yes. Meridian? Yes. Newman? Yes. Hall? Yes. Robson? Yes. Wilma? Yes. All right. Lise Bauer is moved on. Now we move to the we move on to the zoning language, which is two pages. Um, I, I, the major change we did here was the number four short-term rental, um, talking about area requirements for bedrooms. You know, the dwelling has to meet or exceed 600 square feet, 200 feet. We deleted that. Um, just building codes have minimum requirements and, you know, we're, so I think that's spelled out. We don't need to spell it out in the that's correct zoning ordinance. So it's really just the zoning ordinance is about the uh, districts that we're allowing it in and then stands for short-term rentals where they're allowed, you know, non-residential commercial buildings, not on the first story. Um, but they have to meet all zoning ordinance and state codes and property maintenance. And then finally, a short-term rental shall be required for off-street parking. So those are the sections of the zoning ordinance. Does anybody have any questions? Carolyn? I just have a question about our list of the zoning districts. Um, the B2A, does that called transitional business or mixed-use corridor? Yeah. I, 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 I believe the B2A is called the mixed-use corridor, is it, Lisa? I believe it's transition. 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 transitional. Yeah. Transitional business district, and then the B2B is are we not doing, I guess I'll speak to the um, D, that's B3, it's general business district. 
And then are we not including the PDQB, the mixed use corridor? I don't have my zoning ordinance book. I forgot it. So do you, does anybody have the zoning? Oh, you've got it. All right. Oh, thank you. Well, I think our discussion was that there was a lot of residential in the B2B. That was why it wasn't included, but it could be misremembering. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Okay. The reason why the B2B, because of the amount of residential properties in that district. So oh, potentially three, maybe properties that are the original ones. single family dwelling. You're saying in the B2B? Wasn't that all of along Emma Street right there? It goes from yeah. I guess I don't have a map in front of me. Sorry. It goes along Emma Street. Can yeah. we get the map up on the screen? Is that possible? I can try. Thank you. Yeah, it's like a both sides of Emmett Street until so you take Grove and then that like side mm -hmm. steps over. Yeah, it's right here. I don't think it's in the And so we call us talking about that district last year. All right. <clears throat> I can't really see it on this map. Uh, okay. Starting on the north end of that, it's the um, the, the bank on the left side of the green strip, and the dry cleaners, and then on the right hand side, which was the new review, which is now also the right? Mm hmm. And then we stepping down from there and so we would drop this block for your four residential small lots right there where the cursor was. And then the big tall brick building. The zip building. building. Yeah, the zip building. And then 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 Um, yeah, I guess there's I guess there's very few single family houses that would be affected by that. well their section four number one says it can only be allowed in non-residential buildings. Yeah. Oh right. So that's your that's your safeguard. Well that and it can only be on the second story. So do we include that on the district list? That would be a yeah. to them. Yeah. Sure. So what's that? Is that called the mixed use district? It's the yeah, B2B use. Mixed use mixed corridor. corridor. Mixed use corridor. And B2A is transitional and B3 is general business or your CBD. Yes, yeah. B2A is transitional business. I will guarantee you in the new zoning code, we will be changing these names. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> Say it again. That was it for my question. Okay. Any other discussion? All right. Would the public like to weigh in? I don't want to name. I don't want to restate. Let's state your name again. Uh, Christopher Perry again. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, and your I'll, address. I'll restate 414 Wakazoo. Okay. Um, I don't want to restate the first floor, but it sounds like that would be something that we could hopefully ask for a variance at that point in time, considering the nature of the building. But yeah. overall, that would I think I think we might be the only building that qualifies under that type of situation. So thank you. Thank you. John, uh, would that building be eliminated because of number one under section four? It, well, it's it's non-conforming. I mean, it's I hate to use the term, it's grandfathered. 
but it's it's non-conforming because it's 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 been in the district. So it would fall into the same category yep. in, before the zoning board of appeals. Mm -hmm. I have a question now. If we're going to go with the ZBA, what would be the hardship? Right. Well, their their hardship would be, and you know, I uh, would be that it's a historical building. It probably predates the zoning code. And what's without a doubt? Without a doubt, yeah. And it and and the uh, even if it was used as a single family residence, uh, it 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 still would be non-conforming because it's in the the business district so that to me, that's part of the hardship it's that it's an it's an existing historical building that was you know established prior to the zoning code and it currently doesn't meet any of the zoning standards so in order to bring it into somewhat of conformity there may be a basis for a variance so it addresses some of those standards and you're going to see this more often. We've got a couple other ones that are brewing that kind of fit the same mold. It's awful hard to take a historic property and fit it into the context of a modern zoning ordinance without running into problems. Any more discussion? So the additions to this, the revisions would be under section three, number one, C, B2A would be re renamed to traditional business district. Transitional. Transitional. Transitional, excuse me. B3 would be general uh, business district. And then we'd be adding the B2B, which is the mixed use corridor. Which would become, it would be after C and become D. Yes. D would become E and Correct. E would become F. Yeah. yeah. All right, any other discussion? Does someone like to entertain a motion? I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion to start a public hearing for June 21st, 2023, to solicit public input on the proposed zoning amendment to establish the zoning districts for short term rentals and applicable standards. A second. Okay. Rick made the motion. Doug made the second roll call or any more discussion. Roll call. Hall? Yes. Robson? Yes. Roma? Yes. Braddock? Yes. Buck? Yes. Detmer? Yes. McSweeney? Yes. Meridian? Yes. Newman? Yes. Oh, I want to acknowledge Carolyn sent us information about a new type of short-term rental, which is very similar to a bed and breakfast where you can rent a room in your house, but you, the owner of the house is there during the short-term rental. So we discussed that. I think it was with the subcommittee members present. And um, what, what was decided is that uh, it would, if we did allow it, it would be through the bed and breakfast language because you're renting a room. Um, and I don't know if we would need to do additional language or if it could just apply through the bed and breakfast licensing. B and B. B and B. Yeah. So anyway, I wanted to acknowledge that we had discussed it and it sounds like we don't have to write new language for that. Don't uh, B and B's have rental restrictions on how close they can be? Or... Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're and they're capped at a pretty low number. So, yeah. All right. Now we are moving on to the cap recommendation. We did not see this, so I didn't have time to do any research or consideration. So I guess I would ask the. Commission, are you prepared to discuss this and make a recommendation? If, if you didn't get it until today, and I apologize, uh, you're going to have the public hearing on June 21st. You can consider the cap, discuss it at that meeting. 
the, the planning commission at some point just needs to give the council a recommendation on what you think the appropriate cap is. So I think you still have time if you don't want to consider it. Well, are, do people feel ready to consider it? No? Okay. Yeah, I don't, it, it, it. Yeah, so we, we did it at, yeah, 40. After seeing this, does 40 still seem like the right number? Okay. Yeah. So, John, are you comfortable with us since we had this discussion prior? That's fine. You, you, you pegged it at 40? Yeah. Okay. So, we, do we make a motion well, or a resolution? Well, Charlie. As I, as I mentioned earlier, I think that it, not just a number. We have to give a rationale. We have to we have to explain right. our recommendation. So perhaps we should have that discussion first before we. Uh, well, I would say that the rationale is uh, fifteen one intents and purposes, which I have an old version of it. I, it got lost in the pile of the new version. The city council finds a short-term rental of dwelling units in the city of Petoskey, provides value to our local economy, but can also bring with it negative effects to the year-round quality of neighborhoods, housing supply, and public health and safety. The city has enacted this regulatory ordinance, this cap, to strike a regulatory balance between the interests of community residents, business owners, visitors, and property owners. I think that's the justification. But why 40? Because there were... 33 currently. And we figured with the them only being allowed in the commercial districts, it seemed like a uh, number that we could, you know, add to later if we needed, but we wanted to be very calculated, I guess, about how many we initially allowed. Why not just leave it at 33? I'm just well, I'm why just would you asking. Through, yeah, I guess why would you go through all this if you're not? Because we need a short term. Because we need a short term rental ordinance. So you are proposing? I'm not proposing it. I'm just. I'm saying. Uh huh. If we have reasons for picking forty, mm -hmm. I think we should state them, so council can understand. Okay, so if we picked, seems to me that we picked an arbitrary number. Well, the reason was to cover the existing and allow for some some small amount of. And, and, and is that, is that the census of the short term? That was the discussion was for some group and then kind of see how it developed yeah. and reconsider, you know, after a year or after two years. Understanding that growth in short term rentals takes away, potentially takes away the availability of longer term housing for residents. Right, but keep in mind the new ordinance doesn't allow ADUs or residential housing to become short term. I understand that. But you, you could, that's the rationale for 40, but you could disagree with 40. And I, I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm suggesting the reason yeah. why we take that number. Our housing didn't have it at 35. Right. Our housing stock is. Mm -hmm. Is that that's our housing stock, huh? Yeah. 3,533. You could cap it at one percent, that'd be 35. Yeah. And your rationale stated in your master plan that you want to make right. the residential areas affordable and primarily for long-term residents. So that's your rationale. I'm that that's an argument that I would like to see incorporated in our recommendation, whatever the number is. All right. Yeah. So you can make it, it make 70 and make it two percent. I don't care. But I think we need right. to. I think, I think because our housing is so we're talking about 3,500, that's such a small stock that we can't afford to give up any of it. So if so, one percent seems like uh, that ought to be the limit. That's that's yeah. making sense to me. Mm -hmm. Say it again. Five, five, so it allows for two one, additional. Yeah, of course. But case. keep in mind that the. Um, the grandfathered 19 will become available licenses going forward. At some point. At some point. Yeah, at some point. I, 
I think there's broad consensus that we want to tackle this issue slowly, mm -hmm. and and we're all looking at a a low a low number as a starting point. I do recall the uh, a comment being made that there were conversations with applicants ongoing, and that the forty was was chosen to incorporate the ones these discussions ongoing, and I would just Again, I'm in support of, of starting out with a very low number, but if we've had conversations with, with any, I'm not sure you know, if, if you're aware of any that have made investments in the properties with, you, with the idea that they're going well, to. Th there are some out there that have been operating as short-term rentals for a while that we don't have licensed. So I had recommended in my letter and, 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 and there's the numbers are all over the board, but in, in terms of trying to keep the cap low, I had recommended uh, anywhere from 50 to 75. But if, if the planning commission is comfortable starting at 40, again, the council is the one that establishes the cap. But I think you're at 33, but there are some out there that have been are, are operating as short term rentals that are not licensed that once, once the ordinance is passed, then it's going to be up to the city to go to them and tap on the door saying, hey, you've got to get licensed. But we don't know if those are conforming use. Well, well hold on. Existing or not. But if, if they're residential, they they can't opt in. Right. Well, they, they can't can. opt in. But if there, there are there, there could be properties in the commercial district that are operating right. that are not licensed. So I, I get the 1% 35, but that only gives you two. And there should be a little bit of latitude to pick up some of the ones that may be out there that are not licensed yet. But can be. But yes. can be. Yeah. I am very uncomfortable with just doing 35. Yeah. Well, I, I'm sorry, but I don't have a lot of sympathy for somebody who's operating without a license when the uh, licensing is on the books today. Well, some people may not know, uh, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. I mean. Well, I would like to err on the side of low. So we have 40 was comfortable for everybody. The last conversation we had, I like the idea of not going above 1%, which would put it at 35, but I'm also hearing there may be a need in the areas where it's loud. So I, I, you know, I'm willing to go 40 because that gives them a little more leeway. And again, the city council, if they're, if they decide they in the commercial areas, there's more than we are guessing. City Council can decide whether they want to um, raise the cap to enable those to exist. Yeah, City Council is going to decide in any case. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but for instance, I would be very comfortable saying that, you know, 30, 35 represents 1%. Uh -huh. But in the event that there are other currently unlicensed operations that would conform, uh, we're recommending that, that you consider 40 to allow for those businesses to, to okay. transfer into a properly licensed environment. That's okay with me, but I think that's the kind of explanation I'd like to see accompany the numbers. Right. So. Okay. Any other discussion? Well, I would just add that 40 is a good number. Oh, oh I'm sorry. 40 is a good number, I think. Okay. Well, I like what not, Charlie is suggesting that we say we'd like to keep it at a 1% camp. Cap because of the shortage because of the shortage of housing stock and um but if they find the need that going to 40 is a reasonable increase if they feel the need yeah, just for discussion can i ask john a question um i just wondered what your experience might be I, as i was thinking about this um especially in commercial districts maybe uh second floor especially like cbd you know is there some thing we're missing where some of these might actually work function as a short-term rentals uh, financially work when it's been very difficult to, to use them otherwise because of the cost of um, the renovation. Is that ever come in? So in other words, it's it's something that might we've had these spaces set empty. Yeah, um, in, in uh, well, your neighbor in Harbor Springs, the planning commission there, and I think the city council adopted the ordinance a couple of weeks ago, they do not put a cap on any short-term rentals in their CBD. 
their their cap is only in residential districts. So they currently have, I believe, 91 licenses. Mm -hmm. 65 are in the residential districts, and the other 30 are in the uh, central business district. But their policy is they don't care how many are in the central business district as long as they're on, on, on above the first floor. They don't care. They, they're trying to regulate it because it, they, they, it got away from them into the residential district. Right. That's where they put the cap on. Well, I keep hearing you know, the issue in the CBD with, with these upper floors, and we've talked about the cost of you know, making them long-term rentals, and it's apparently very high. And obviously, it seems the short-term rentals can bring in more income and might make something like that work where it wouldn't otherwise. Yeah, I mean, I, it's other community. I mean, I'm giving you an example across the bay. Yeah. Anyway, that's why I didn't, the 40 didn't bother me as much. I didn't. Well, 40 looks very conservative in comparison to the. Those that would have, you know, the analysis, these are the communities that we could find uh, that online that we could find that actually identified what their cap was. And most, you know, if, if you take a look at the averages, the average is 5.8%. So if you're at 35 or 40, you're way below what the other communities are currently operating under. Uh, so that's something to consider. Now, like I said, council can establish the cap. If, if you find that as we start really getting an idea of what we got out there, that if, it, if, it's, a, if it's not a big issue having short-term rentals in just in the central business district above the first floor, and maybe at some point you don't want to include that in the cap. The cap only applies to the districts outside of the central business districts. That would be similar to the parking exempt. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I can see where the commissioner is coming from. We do have some second and third floor spaces downtown that are vacant or that are really underutilized. Maybe you know, creating more short-term rentals would improve the property and the investment. It could be used as an incentive to rehab some of the buildings. Uh, but you know, the idea is let, let's establish a cap. Let's take a look at what's going on. Then we can reevaluate. But I think I think that's a great suggestion. Uh, well, you just brought up a good point that um, looking at the one percent, we're looking at our total housing, but we're not allowing it in our residential. Mm -hmm. So the, the numbers that you gave us, like the ninety-one for Harbor Springs, is the cap for their residential. No, they're, they're they capped it at sixty-five. Yeah, all the, the, the ninety-one. So all these other short term runner caps that you guys found were those for residential or were they for commercial? These were the caps in, in their in their citywide in their ordinance. Okay, they didn't differentiate. <clears throat> uh, well, what would the commission like to do? <laughs> do we need a cap for commercial? Well. You, you you need to establish a, you need to establish a cap for the number of licenses. My suggestion is go with what Charlie's position was. Commissioner Wilmot was saying, let's go to, tell council thirty five up to forty to provide a buffer for conforming non licensed operators. So that gives you we have thirty three that gives you a buffer of seven. Okay. And that's roughly 1.1% of your housing stock. But that they could also consider higher numbers in the central business district. They can, because they can they well, establish. I think that should be part of what we need. And they, and they, they, they established the cap. You're just recommending. And I think your, your policy is, 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 is solid. You want to keep it around 1% of the, of the 3,500 housing stock. But you are agreeing or saying to them that you're providing a buffer because we, we know, we really don't know, but we probably suspect that there are conforming non-licensed properties out there that we have to bring into the licensing procedure, right? Charlie, do you want to make that motion? Well, it's actually, it's actually a resolution. Okay. Great. And the, the, the resolution you. normally starts with whereases, and you've got some whereases there, right? <laughs> and you're in the intent that you read. All right. You know, I, I don't know how formal we want to make this, but. So you have the intent you read. Right. Uh, Short-term, uh, 
The city council, no, the short term rental of dwelling units in the city of Potosky provide value to our local economy. Um, whereas it can also bring with it negative effects, the year round quality of neighborhoods, housing supply, and public health and safety. Um, the Planning Commission is recommending this regulatory ordinance to strike a regulatory balance between the interests of community resident, business owners, visitors, and property owners. Uh, how about a whereas in there? Whereas the housing stock in Petoskey today is 3,500 units. Yeah, 3,533. Whereas current licensed short-term rentals equal 33. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the recommendation is uh, or 40 mm -hmm. conforming use and potentially higher in the central mm -hmm. business mm -hmm. district. Mm -hmm. okay. I got it. There's no Does that work, right. Does that work for you, John? Yes. All right. So, Charlie's provided the resolution. We need a second. Give me a second for that. I'll second. I'm just confused about this discussion. We're simply making a recommendation in the form. Of resolutions are formed by city, passed by city council. Okay. City council okay. passes resolutions and ordinances. Yeah. So, all right. But I'll second that. All right, as it is, because we're writing as, as a resolution. Do you want it uh, in a different format? I don't really care. Well, you can make a recommendation <laughs> and put the whereas in. Too. Right. Just okay. call it a recommendation. Right. Okay. So this is officially a recommendation made by Charlie, seconded by Ted, and uh, any other discussion? Roll call vote. Braddock. Yes. Hawk. Yes. Detmer. Yes. McSweeney. Yes. Meridian. Yes. Newman. Yes. Paul. Yes. Robson. Yes. Wilmot. Yes. All right. Now, oh, what did I do? We are. Oh. Oh, did you make yes. a uh, well, did everybody get a chance to read this letter? I did. Okay. Um, this is a letter from Amber Miro. Uh, she lives at 411 Mineral Street as an owner of a short-term rental and um, is objecting to the fact that we're not going to continue allowing them in the residential area. However, is she a licensed operator at this time? Okay, so then in her case, she wouldn't be allowed to continue if this is passed. That address is not on the list that the city has for grandfather. Oh, you months. know what? She, I purchased my home and property. I live next door to a blighted property. Yeah, I don't. I don't think this location is a short-term rental. I think she would like to be. Oh, at I some see. point, but she's not currently. Okay. So this is someone who would like the right in the um, in the future to allow residential short-term rental, but I do think we've established that we have to protect our housing for long-term residents. All right, moving on to public comment. Uh, public comment for uh, is Albert Moss back on. So if he would like to make the comment that he wanted to make. Yeah, I'm just, uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. I'm just, uh, I, I really think the idea of the subcommittees is a good one. Um, my only concern is that, um, as John said, and John, I'd say your last name, but I think I'd butcher it. Um, is will stuff come forward enough for the public to see it and have changes? As you know, you didn't have a lot of people on this coming to 
uh, planning commissions until the B3A issue came up. And it was good that it was always out in front of us. So um, as John said, these, these two issues that the subcommittee is looking at are things that are meaningful to the city of Petoskey and they're meaningful to the public. And so I just wanna make sure that um, with it not being, because you're keeping it to four, um, it, you're not having the open meeting act, but the stuff will come forward such that the public does get to put input at some time into changes being made. Yes, yes, the, the, um, the subcommittees will meet and create rough drafts and then those will be presented to the full commission and we will have discussion. And when we have those discussions, we'll also allow public comment. Okay. That was my only comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to weigh in? All right, uh, moving on to uh, commissioner comments. I think we're all talked out. <laughs> all right, so updates. You provided us, John, with um, zoning permits, you know, a kind of, oh, Lisa did. Our zoning administrator provided us with activities that happened January through April, which is something we requested to be included during updates. So do you have anything to say about it, Lisa? My goal is to get you this report each month so that each month you can see if you guys want to see what the tally is for the year, if you want to see how that compares, um, just let me know. Okay. And I'm happy to. Can you include to... uh, ADU applications as, as well? Yes. Have we had any? We have one. Well, actually, we have, yeah, we have one. We had an application for one, um, but nothing. She got approval. But nothing has um, happened with it. So, okay. So, thank you. You're welcome, Todd. I just have one question for Lisa and John. Um, I, I don't believe we resolve the issue of the urgent care by the school with the fence. Um, has Does anyone know where that's at? I do not. Um, yeah, right, right up, up right across from McDonald's. Yeah. There's a school. school. The issue is um, at the time of approval, they were told that they needed to have a screening fence for the playground, that people didn't think it was adequate, that cars could park and potentially view the kids on the playground and um, not be there. Just So that never got done. Um, when did the facility open? Last summer? Yeah. yeah. And um, they, uh, apparently there was some discussion that materials were an issue or it was hard to get stuff, but it's been such a long time now. We just need to follow up with that. Was that agreed upon during the site plan review? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, then we'll, so we'll, 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 we'll follow up. Last I heard, um, the city planner was in contact with the um, manager and okay. they were, apparently it was on order and it, they were waiting for it. So okay. um, we can definitely follow up on that. Okay. All right, any other updates? Okay. I don't have any. All right. All right. So we may adjourn at at 840. This is a long one. A shorter meeting? Yeah.